Good, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Leinster Rugby's um, webinar on coach-athlete relationship at, here at Loughborough uh, University. Um, just before we start, uh, just some housekeeping. Um, so, if anyone is struggling with sound, um, just check your uh, the bars down below. Um, you can choose uh, the the audio output. So, you might want to to have a look at this. Although I'm conscious that I'm saying this, and if you can't hear it, then you won't be able to hear what I'm saying. So um, yeah, we, we might be able to put a message to Tom on uh, the private chat, or sorry, the, the chat to uh, allow people to, um, if they're having sound issues. Um, if there are any um, image issues, please again input them in the chat. Um, both myself and, and other members of the team will be able to pick them up and help uh, resolve some of those. <coughs> Um, as we go on this evening, uh, there will be an opportunity to uh, to um, <clears throat> engage with, with the panel um, and uh, you'll be able to do this again through the, the chat um, function. So if there are any questions you have, we'll pick them up um, on an ongoing uh, basis if that's okay. Um, so uh, we'll start by um, introducing a few people. Um, first of all, uh, a special uh, welcome and thank you to uh, Val Ullman for attending in the audience here at Loughborough University. Um, Val um, is the late Len Ullman's uh, wonderful wife. Um, Len has a, a strong connection with both Loughborough University and St Mary's University and I know has supported many PhDs and many academic staff both here at Loughborough and at St Mary's University. So Val, you're, you're extremely welcome um, to be here tonight. Um, and then our, the, our two panellists. Um, first of all, Sophia. Um, Sophia is a professor of psychology, is that correct? Correct. Um, at Loughborough University and um, we've also got Ben Bartlett who is a senior coach uh, developer within the football industry. Correct. And stuff. Um, I'd also just like to thank uh, Derek uh, Mabry from uh, Leinster Rugby for organising this event and, and coercing and, and hustling people. Um, uh, to attend both on the panel and also uh, to those of you listening at home, um, and also Coach Logic for helping to support um, uh, the technology behind this event. So, um, hopefully, everyone at home can uh, 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 begin to access this through, through the live webinar. Um, so, we'll, we'll, we'll make a start uh, now. Um, <clears throat> we've got a, a short video for those of you who are American football fans, you would have probably seen this at some point. Um, but we're going to uh, run a 90-second uh, uh, video that hopefully will encapsulate some of the things we'll be talking about tonight. Like we talked about before, Justin, I think everything goes back to the relationships, and that, that's the foundation of everything that we do. And then, you know, it's, it's a shared ownership, and, and I think that uh, people want to feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves, and when they do feel like their opinions matter, they're truly heard, but they're dealt with like grown men, uh, you know, there's a mutual respect that exists between our players and our coaches, and it's all about us working in the same direction and, and figuring out it's not necessarily who's right, it's what's right. And, and that's what we try to be consistent with. Uh, but, but everything is foundationally driven in building and developing those relationships, getting to know these guys. And I think once you have that set, then that enables people to feel comfortable to be vulnerable. It opens up the lines of communication where you can get the clarity from a coaching standpoint. And the biggest thing with that communication is it's got to be clear, open, and honest, but it's also got to be ongoing. And it's easy to say that early on, uh, but there's a true commitment to it. And certainly, you know, what I appreciate so much is there's whether it's players or coaches, they keep me accountable too. You know, I remember an instance a couple weeks ago with one of our coaches, and you kind of just get frustrated, and, and he had the you know, presence to be able to say, hey, everything we do is predicated on communication. And I stepped back and I said, wow, you're exactly right. And I think when we've got that, whether that's from our players or from our coaches, that can create uh, a healthy culture that hopefully you can sustain some continuity and, and be able to navigate through the good and the bad. When it comes so I think that's a really powerful um, a video to, to start the uh, evening with and, and that strong um, in, uh, emphasis on the importance of relationships, um, even in elite high, high profile sport like American football. Um, Sophia, so I think my f the first question to you will be, you've obviously got an extensive portfolio in um, the coach-athlete relationship literature. Um, why do you think it's such an important factor in terms of successful coaching? 
Yes, um, <clears throat> I'm sure um, you will all agree. Um, if, if we if we were to um, to think of coaching, um, uh, it is very very different today from wh what it was maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, 30 years ago, and maybe um, even five years ago, uh, coaching um, revolved around coaches. Um, uh, how coaches will uh, uh, plan uh, the training, how they will deliver the training. Um, they were responsible for the, the short and long-term goals of uh, the athletes of the team. Um, they will select, deselect. Um, everything around coaching uh, revolved uh, around what coaches uh, did. Um, uh, modern coaching on coaching uh, in the 21st century is very, very different. Um, and it may be different because the nature of the athlete, of the player, has changed. Um, young players um, are socialized, are brought up and nurtured uh, very, very differently. Um, uh, the parents uh, want their kids to be a part of societies, of associations, of groups, uh, whereby uh, they uh, take uh, uh, responsibility and they are accountable for, uh, for their actions. Uh, they want their kids to be ind independent and voice their voices. Um, so uh, take that into a, a coaching context, into sport, um, uh, the, the expectations are very different uh, and, and therefore coaches have to adapt uh, to, to, the, to, to this environment, to what the athletes expect now from, from them. And therefore um, coaching today is about, about the combined interrelating between the coach and the athlete. Um, it is about, uh, coaches also realize that uh, they cannot really bring about uh, um, uh, success, uh, and successful performances and, and they cannot make a difference um, uh, if uh, uh, they don't have the input of their, of their athletes. So coaching is about the combined interrelating between the coach and the athlete it, and it is that unit relationship that coaches and athletes develop um, that defines um, the, um, the success and effectiveness of coaching, okay. I believe. Um, ben, just on that point, the, and the, particularly, I know you used to coach before you became a coach developer, that, how have you noticed the, the coach-athlete relationship changing over that period of time for um, you? I, I, you know, I work for the National Association. Um, we've shifted very much in terms of the way <coughs> that we focus upon coaching uh, coach educating coaches and supporting their development from I guess what was historically very much a command and control approach to a more collaborative and more supportive approach and I guess that work with coaches is probably reflective of the needs and expectations of players both young and old in the modern culture. Okay, so um, it's an interesting start and I know Sophia you've spoken lots about relationship quality and you, you sort of briefly touched upon it there, what, what, what do you specifically mean by that what, and, and what characteristics the coaches need to have in order to build uh, a, a relationship that is beneficial for both themselves and the, and the athlete? Um, the way that we have, um, the research that we have done highlights that uh, the relationship between a coach and an athlete is, um, is three-dimensional. Um, so there are three dimensions uh, that define or describe a good quality relationship. So the first, that, uh, the first um, dimension is closeness. Uh, closeness reflects um, coaches and athletes' affective bond, the mutual trust, the respect, the appreciation, uh, liking one another, caring for one another. Um, it is very important that the athlete feels valued uh, and, and, the, uh, and the coaches need to make the athlete feel uh, that is valued, their contribution is appreciated and recognized. Um, that um, the, the coaches treat the athlete, the player, with respect and integrity. So closeness is a very important element uh, for, for the coach to be able to, to, to uh, exhibit manifest through his or her actions. The second di dimension is um, commitment. Um, and commitment reflects <coughs> coaches and athletes' intentions, willingness or, or thoughts to maintain a close relationship over time. Now, we all know that um, uh, in order to develop an athlete uh, to a skillful, competent um, uh, performer, you need time. And uh, in that time, there will be lots of ups and downs, highs and lows, and uh, that will destabilize the quality of the relationship. And commitment is the glue that keeps them together during usually the, the lows that coaches and athletes will experience in the course of their partnership. And finally, you've got complementarity, or what, uh, what we call cooperation. Um, 
cooperation reflects the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, co the, the cooperative acts of interaction between the coach and the athlete. It's about responsiveness, uh, how responsive the coach and the athlete uh, is for each other's efforts. Uh, being receptive, being adaptable, um, so that there will be times where the coach will uh, need to, to, to adapt uh, his or her style um, to be uh, friendly and approachable and open. So all these are characteristics, not only the coach, but also the athlete will have to demonstrate in their interactions. So just on, uh, Ben, just on that, what do you think coaches can do to help improve that relationship quality if we take those three C's into account? and? You know, in your experiences, is there one particular area that that we as coaches need to develop more so than the other? Do you think? Uh, I guess coach development, player development have got some differences, but I guess they're probably underpinned by similar principles. I guess one of those key principles is about the need as much as possible to try and individualise that support. Yeah. And I guess in individualising it, the better we can understand the person that we're responding with, probably the better likelihood we are to be able to respond appropriately and probably if it's going to be a mutual relationship the more likely they are going to be able to respond back to the way that we've worked with them um, and I'm reminded of a experience from early in my coaching life of a, a young player who came on a Saturday morning to a session that we were running um, every week on a Saturday morning she was 20 minutes late and every week that she was late I would do the same thing as a very naive silly coach every time she would turn up 20 minutes late it would be oh, late again um, and after the sixth week of being late, I thought, well, she's obviously not getting my message. So I went and had a conversation with her, and a lot of things emerged that she had a disabled mother. There were lots of things she needed to do on a Saturday morning before she got to training. And I guess my mistake was assuming that there was a problem with her being late, which perhaps if I better understood her, I could support her with. Um, I suppose what was fortunate for me is that over those six weeks, she chose to come back. Some might think the coach isn't necessarily being particularly supportive. I don't think I want to be playing football anymore. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, she's gone on and played for a country. She now plays Premier League football. Um, and whilst I couldn't necessarily make her life necessarily easier, what we did do is to support one of the other parents who was coming from that direction to be able to pick her up on a Saturday morning to at least make her morning a little bit easier and get her to football on time. Um, I guess my mistake is if you just assume that there is no reason why somebody's late, that maybe they're being <coughs> disrespectful, that perhaps we don't have the best opportunity to respond to the needs of that person. Yeah. And in both of your experiences of working with coaches, do you think we do, do you think we allow ourselves as coaches enough time to build that relationship quality, or you know do we spend too much time thinking about the planning and the the outcomes of a session rather than maybe the the actual individual person that we are that we are working with? I think we can make that mistake if we start not with the people, mm -hmm. if we start with the tactics or we start with the session. Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly we will have problems with coach-athlete relationships if we focus principally and maybe disproportionately on the X's and O's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess what we challenge coaches to do is to try and reverse engineer that process and think about who the human beings in my mm -hmm. care and as a result what will the session, what will the game experiences look like and how do we, if those things are important, building opportunities for there to be interaction between coach and athlete and also athletes and athletes, because if those things are important, yeah. those qualities need to be fostered in the same way that passing, dribbling or tackling might be important. I, th I think um, coaches, um, whilst I appreciate that um, relationships take time to develop, and uh, particularly when you have um, a team of athletes, uh, maybe 16, 18, 20 athletes in, in your squad that uh, you have to take care and uh, look after, it, it, it is not an easy task. Um, but uh, I think it is worth giving the time to know and understand each player in the team or squad because it will make a huge difference in their individual performance and as a result in their collective performance. Mm -hmm. So uh, investing the time to getting to know, getting understanding the, their athletes, their needs, their, um, their fears, their uh, aspirations, their goals will make a, a difference. Now, it is important to also appreciate that the relationship um, is, is a very dynamic thing um, and it will go through, as I said earlier, um, uh, ups and downs and um, there will be external circumstances like uh, perhaps performance slumps, selection, deselection, injury um, that, will, uh, that is likely to destabilize the quality of the relationship and coaches need to have, uh, as I say, the, um, uh, the figure on the relationship pulse to, to really uh, appreciate that, um, that there will be instances where they need to know and understand being receptive of, of their circumstances so that if something happens, they're able to pick it up before it gets a, a, a big problem, yeah. to become it, a big problem. In, in, in your experiences of, of working with coaches, have there been 
Maybe, are there common characteristics and behaviours that those coaches exhibit where they've had been able to develop successful coach-athlete relationships? Are there some maybe key things that they do that are, are common across those coaches? I think I think coaches who um, are um, uh, interested in their athletes, really truly interested in 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 their in the person, um, are, are are better coaches. Um, and as I said, it takes a lot, a lot of time, effort, and energy on their part in order to um, show that interest. Um, but at the same time, it's the little things that may be able to do, like a little pat on the back or a, an individual uh, discussion, you know, coming around and saying, how was school, how was work today? Um, or an individual instruction or, or technical, you know, um, uh, uh, instruction can make a huge difference to that individual. The coach came and talked to me today. It, it's, a, it's a big thing for the athlete. I think we sometimes underestimate those those small conversations and and the power that they that they have, particularly I mean, yeah, over the course. Speaking of you know football and rugby experiences, where you may only get contact with those athletes for or those young people for what four to eight hours a week, mm -hmm. um, and and I guess it's also about recognising that they're they're more than just a young performer, but they are a school child, a you know a brother or sister, and so on. So I guess it's about understanding them as a, as a, as a whole person. Um, ben, you, you touched upon that, the, the individualised approach, and you mentioned it Sophia, as well. And I just wonder, <clears throat> I think we find it quite easy, don't we, from a maybe a technical, tactical point of view, maybe even psychological point of view, whereby we can work with the player to set goals and, and, and targets, maybe on areas they need to improve or develop. I just wonder how much, or what we can do maybe better to individualise that approach in terms of our one-to-one -one relationships with those with those players? Yeah, I guess from a formal practice perspective, the more opportunity we have to free up ourselves while practice is operating to have those individual conversations, the better, and there's probably some relatively straightforward things that can help with that. Yeah. I guess the more the practice looks like, in my case, the game of football, probably less time the coach needs to spend driving and organising the practice and helping the players to understand it. They can just play free in the practice. If that frees us up from needing to drive what the practice looks like, it probably gives us the opportunity to work with the individual players on an individual basis, but also get a sense of what they're seeing and experiencing while they're playing the particular game. I think the second thing that can probably help is if we space that learning, so if we play for a period of seven or eight minutes, give ourselves three or four minutes break, that gives the players an opportunity to relax, interact with each other, but it also gives us the opportunity to work around the individuals, pick off some individual things and maybe work with them. Also, final part is if the game is flowing quite well, it maybe gives us the opportunity to step in, have short and brief interactions with the players while that's going on, and recognise the importance of those things. From a coach development perspective, I think something that is key is we use video and audio quite a lot, quite quite frequently. And we also use, I'm not sure it's completely objective, but objective analysis of the types of interactions that a coach is having with the players. Are there biases about certain players that they interact with more than others? Is there a more positive bias with a particular player than another's? And I guess in some sense it's just making them aware of what they're doing and is what they're doing fully conscious while they're doing it, or is perhaps there some things that they can manage in terms of improving the way that they interact with the players? Okay, some really, really uh, good and practical um, points to take on board there. Thank you for that, Ben. Um, Sophia, you, you talk about the three different stages of formulating, maintaining, concluding relationships. Um, it just going to start with the formulating one. Is there anything that we as coaches can do um, from a, a sort of very practical perspective in terms of getting to know our players better? Um, can you think of some sort of techniques or, or processes we could go through to? Well, um, it's it's very very simple. I would say the, the the one thing that you do, particularly in the beginning of the season, is to just um, uh, having a, a short conversation with each player to find uh, the, their the, their starting uh, you know their starting place, uh, where they are, uh, how they feel, what they they want to achieve, and, and having a, a conversation about um, the uh, perhaps the season ahead. Uh, it is all about getting to know uh, and understand that, in, that individual. Um, as I said earlier, it's about knowing and understanding um, their likes, their dislikes, um, their goals and aspirations, their fears, um, and, and really, uh, and that doesn't really only apply to the, um, the beginning of, of a relationship uh, or a partnership, uh, applies throughout is uh, creating an environment where uh, the coach and the athlete, uh, particularly the athlete, feels um, open to voice their opinion, to express their thoughts, 
um, uh, without feeling perhaps that uh, uh, they will embarrass them themselves or reje be rejected or humiliated. Um, from the court's point of view, it is important that they are very attentive and um, listening and um, uh, truly trying to grasp um, how the athletes um, feel and think from their own perspective. Um, and um, as I said, this is not just at the early stages of the relationship. It's, it's, a, it's a process of uh, continually investing um, in, in that, getting to know. But because the athletes go through uh, stages of development uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you don't really, really want to miss anything. Um, in addition to that, uh, what often happens and what we have seen is once the relationship is, um, uh, is established, um, what happens is coaches feel that they know it all, uh, they know their athlete inside out, uh, but that is not the case. Uh, often coaches become complacent and um, they feel that um, what they know can carry them through. Uh, but if they don't update uh, what they know, they may miss uh, quite um, uh, substa significant information that may help them for um, coaching the athlete. Mm. I think that's a really interesting point as well. I think sometimes there's coaches when we feel secure in that relationship maybe I guess it's a bit like any relationships we have in life we maybe Indeed. neglect it yeah. a little bit um, yeah. uh, Ben just coming on just on that on that point and I know you, you, you do a lot around practice design it, the way we design our sessions how is, is that an opportunity for us whether it's football rugby tennis whatever sport we coach is it is there is there an opportunity within in the planning of that session to allow us to, you know, have focus on those opportunities to, to work more individually with players to actually have time and opportunity to develop those relationships? Completely. And if it's something that coaches or a coach feels they're perhaps not committed to or not succeeding at in the way that they might like to, certainly planning in a formal sense to say, I will stop three times during the session and I will have meaningful interactions with ten of the players. Yeah. It sounds a little bit kind of... Uh, uh, prescriptive and perhaps a little bit overly organised but I guess without going through that commitment it may be that those things can become quite challenging so it may be saying I'm going to try and have two meaningful interactions with each of the players tonight and asking the players at the end did I manage that because it may also be that our perception of a meaningful <coughs> interaction might be good evening whereas to a child it might be asking them how their day was asking them how something was good asking what's going on at home and maybe through developing that connection it may afford us the opportunity to support them around football or cricket or otherwise yeah. And I guess the, the, the second thing is, certainly within football, there are varying layers in the sense that a goalkeeper coach may have already more of an individual in, uh, relationship with a player yeah. because that's probably more of a one-to-one -one relationship than perhaps a team coach who's got 12, 14, 16 players that they've got to look after. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that's easier or harder. It's probably <coughs> just different because sometimes mm -hmm. the very personal one-to-one -one relationship can also be problematic yeah. because that closeness can also sometimes lead to a degree of comfort and perhaps not being able to challenge and, and stretch the players as much as we might like. I guess it's not dissimilar to maybe relationships players and athletes will have with their physio or their, uh, the doctor and so on where, where they have that maybe I, I guess the players perceive it as a safer environment to, to have more, more open and honest conversations. Um, Sophia you mentioned previously about the, the, the word empowerment and I know Probably the work we, we do in academia and in coaching, coach development, we use it a lot. I know uh, the coaches at Leinster, we talk about an empowerment with the players. For me, that the giving the confidence to the player to actually ask and challenge us as coaches is probably a practical definition of what empowerment is potentially. How, how do we get to that stage where we've established an environment where our relationships are so secure enough that that two-way conversation can take place? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll refer to an example uh, yeah. that I have. Um, uh, it happened recently. I, I had a colleague of mine, a parent, mm -hmm. uh, who came to me and said, um, uh, my, my daughter, and, and the, the name I will disguise, I will just call it uh, Jane, um, my daughter is not uh, liking her coach, doesn't like the coach, um, she doesn't enjoy going to training sessions, um, she finds it very difficult to enjoy herself, um, uh, to the extent that she's thinking of um, stopping uh, the sport that she thought she liked a lot. Um, uh, she said to me, um, do you have any advice? C can, I, can I help her? Can we, can we, can we do anything? Uh, because she's quite talented. Um, 
I said, um, okay, let's let's try a couple of things. Can you uh, please um, try to ask um, your daughter Jane to, as soon as she goes to training, to say hello to the coach? Um, and, uh, and how are you? Um, if, if, if she can engage with the coach, you know, at this starting point, it would be great. Um, subsequently, uh, during the training session, um, can you ask Jane if she can ask one, one or two questions to coach? Um, uh, if the coach, for example, wants some help, maybe Jane can put her hand up to, to assist the coach. Uh, or during a, a particular skill that um, uh, she practices, maybe she can ask the coach to come along and, and have a look because she's not quite certain if it is done correctly. Um, and at the end of the training, uh, maybe Jane, what she could do is to ensure that uh, before she um, leaves the, the training ground, she says to the coach, um, thank you very much and see you next time. So um, I ask um, the parent, um, who is a colleague uh, as well, um, after a few weeks, how things are going and, and how is Jenny uh, getting along with the coach? Um, and uh, quite surprisingly, she said, uh, it's actually, things are, seem to be going well. Uh, we don't have any, uh, any issues. She doesn't come back in the car complaining about the coach or uh, not enjoying the sport. So what has happened there? Uh, the coach hasn't changed, probably, in behavior. Um, what has happened is that we empowered uh, the athlete to engage with the coach, um, to, to, to be part of what we call the coaching practice, the coaching process yes. uh, of her own development, uh, more or less. Now, with her engagement, may we, we may have also um, um, invited the coach to interact with Jane a little bit differently. Um, so uh, we empowered the coach. So this is one example that athletes can do. Yeah. Uh, so they can engage their interpersonal skills. Okay. Uh, they can really do things to, to change the circumstances within which yeah. you know, um, they, they operate uh, in, in the training uh, environment. Um, from the coach's point of view, I, I think there are other things uh, that um, coaches can try. Uh, one is, um, one thing that really will help is to, to set the scene from a coach's point of view. Um, from the point of view that they can say, this is, I, I, I want you, I invite you as athletes to be open with me. Um, I, I, you know, here is an environment where we, we can make mistakes. Uh, this is an environment where you can ask for feedback. Mm -hmm. This is an environment where you can vo voice your concerns, your fears, uh, and everything that uh, is relevant uh, to the situation we are in. Uh, so setting the scene is important because after all, um, if you think, as we said earlier, we don't have all the knowledge. And athlete, athletes hold a lot of knowledge that we as coaches can use. Um, uh, coaches that do not have a crystal ball, they don't know it all, right? So it is good to have the athlete's perspective, uh, really, you know, inviting them into this process. The, the, the second part of, of that is to really invite and remind the athletes to open up and ask questions, you know, and how, how, was, how does the gym help you? Does it help you? Is it anything else that we can do uh, to help you with your strength or your speed, you know? Um, so invite athletes to, to, like you said, I think, about you know, giving you feedback, um, what works, what doesn't work. And, um, and finally is uh, acknowledging uh, and thanking the athlete for uh, when they come uh, with um, some, um, uh, some thoughts, um, uh, thanking them and appreciating the courage that it takes to speak up. Because it's not easy for athletes. Um, we, we have to appreciate it. It's not easy for athletes to come and say what they think. Um, and of course, uh, athletes may come to us as coaches uh, with all sorts of things that perhaps do not fit in with what we want to do or how we think you know, um, uh, we need to proceed uh, and move forward. And, and we are educationalists. We, we are there to educate the athlete. If something is not quite fitting, then we can explain why it doesn't fit. Uh, whilst what, when it is something that is of value, then again, we acknowledge that. Sophia's point about the environment is probably critical, and it certainly resonated with me that she spoke about the importance of the environment being supportive of mistakes, yeah. it being, being supportive of a two-way discussion and feedback, and I guess what's key then is that the coach follows through on that. 
and there are you know many examples of coaches one who stands in my mind who very much promotes that and I've seen coaches that when they then go two three nil down in the game they shirk and sink into the dugout as if to say I trusted you when things are going well and now they're not going so well I don't trust you so much and the national coach that I've worked with over the last couple of years does the opposite when things aren't going very well he stands from his dugout and stands by the side of the pitch and that's his overt message to say I'm with you, it's okay, and I guess if we, we say mistakes are okay, feedback's important that, to make sure that we follow through on that and say we think this is important and when it happens that we are supportive of mistakes, we are supportive of feedback, and if we get feedback that perhaps grates us a little bit or like Sophia says maybe doesn't resonate with exactly what we believe, that we're open to that, we move with that and it helps us develop a deeper and stronger relationship with the athlete. And, and the beauty of that is that you empower not just the athlete but also the coach mm. and they feel both empowered yeah. and, and, and therefore they can move much uh, uh, quicker and faster from a place A to a place B which is a better yeah. place for both of them. Yeah. I, had, I had the great pleasure of being with a coach who worked with a group of under 10s at a professional club on the south on Monday evening and with the players with their individual action plans he supported them to develop a bronze, silver and gold challenge which they can link to what they practice at home, what they practice in training sessions or what they practice on match day. But Sophia's point about demonstrating <coughs> vulnerability, he's done that because he's devised his own bronze, silver and gold challenge, which he shared with the players. So he's ultimately said, you're working on this, but so am I. Give me some feedback about how I'm getting on against these challenges, part of which is maybe being a little calmer on the sideline on match day. So he's asking for the players to go and give me feedback and demonstrate a little bit of vulnerability himself, which is probably quite empowering for the players also. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's really important. And I know a you know, particular strategy I use sometimes is being open and honest with the players to say, look, I've never done this before, this is what I think we're going to get out of it, but we're going to give it a go and see what, what happens. And, and actually, you do begin to build stronger, maybe not relationships in that first instance, but, but more trust and, and, and two-way communication. So I think it's, um, yeah, I think that that's a really good point about being, being okay with being vulnerable as a, as a, as a coach. Um, I think some of the other things that have come up here around noticing being subtle with our messages and, and, and grasping are, are really important things that maybe we don't focus in on too often that we're more concentrated with the maybe the more the physical technical and tactical outcomes I just on that I just wonder whether predominantly the audience that are back at home in Ireland will be invasion game coaches whether the language and culture of those types of games allow us to have that time to, to build those relationships um, and I wonder how we can begin to change maybe some of the language that, that, that we use to, to, to create more effective coach-athlete relationships. So what is exactly the language that they're, you I, I, know, I think, well, I think if you want to, on a, on a maybe on a more phys philosophical level, you know, about combative, combativeness, you know, war, you know, being hard in the tackle, those sort of very military type language that we might use mm -hmm. and whether, is there a need to maybe soften that and maybe develop a more humanistic language that we I use see. with younger, younger well, players? The way, the way I see it is that um, you don't need to take away uh, that sort of, you know, um, uh, competitive uh, um, um, language that you, you might have. I, I think the relationship, it, it actually helps the coach challenge and push and stretch and uh, um, uh, the, the athlete uh, because the athlete knows, you know, that my coach has got um, the best interest at heart because uh, we are connected. He knows my aspirations, my goals. I, they know that I want to be the best that they can be if I can be in my sport and therefore they are pushing me. Um, to, to kind of uh, be the best that I, I can be. So I, d I don't think we, uh, as long as the language is not inappropriate, uh, it's not offensive, I don't think we need to change anything. The only thing that we need to change is to appreciate that by connecting with the other pe uh, person, being on the same wavelength, uh, we can help them a little bit more, we can push them a little bit more, we can make them a better athlete. Okay. Language can probably be key for experimentation and if a development program, we think that's important, uh, a wise colleague of mine used to try and move away from language like must, always and never to more, more possibly supportive experimental language like try, feel, let me know how it goes, think about this. Uh, that left something a little uncomfortable because they felt try meant that you could get away with not necessarily trying, that try meant that you always failed. 
whereas his view was that I'm going to have a go at something and see what the outcome is, and maybe if the outcome isn't quite right by trying to do the right thing, it may be in time that I can find a way towards a more creative solution that isn't currently in my repertoire. Whereas I guess with things like always and must, it will probably be that you'll try something that you know will already work because you know that the outcome will give you what the coach has demanded from you. That's yeah, right. I guess, you know, this is quite deterministic language that the coaches may be mindful of um, because if, if you want to be collaborative, then it might kind of limit yeah. that collaboration. So j just on, the, on, on, on those points, and as I, I guess maybe looking at coach-athletic relationship from a chronological perspective now, um, when it comes towards the end of the season, more often than not, we... Uh, we for want of a better phrase, relinquish our relationships because they go on to another age group, go on to some other coaches, they move schools and so on. The, what I, I guess what would be the, the, the testament and uh, how would the coaches know that they've developed a really positive coach-athlete relationship? What are the signs that are there from, from the way the players interact and, and almost say goodbye, do you think? Um, oh, that, that is an interesting uh, question. Um, um, I guess, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you leave a, a good coach uh, thinking of, of him or her very fondly. Um, uh, they, they gave you something that uh, you value, uh, and it may, may not just be a physical, uh, not that I'm, I'm only, you know, I'm, I'm better athlete now, but uh, I'm a better person as well. Uh, and in addition to that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, you have developed good interpersonal skills. Uh, which you can take um, uh, over and beyond uh, uh, your sport domain. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting point. I think um, the academy manager at Manchester United very recently spoke about actually not developing players first and foremost, but developing better people. And do you think sometimes those things are, we 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 pay lip service to them, and actually is there something concrete that, that sits underneath that? I think there's probably a couple of things. I think the, the point that you made about chronology is possibly problematic in the mm. sense that we organise sport based upon when people are born or about what year they are. Uh, and that means that they can have an under-12 year which they spend with Michael and they never see Michael again because Michael coaches the under-12s yeah. as opposed to having a, a less linear and mm. a perhaps less organised way of organising the players which may mean that I might come back to you in six months' time or I may come back to you in nine months' time playing with different players in a different context. Mm. I think maybe if we think perhaps subtly differently about the way that we organise the programme, it may be that powerful relationships can continue to develop and return back to and people can take the strength that they get from you as well as perhaps the strength that they take from time with another coach. Yeah. I guess fundamentally if we think developing, I guess, a more holistic person um, in our programme is important, we probably need to think about what that looks like and how those elements are, are included in the programme. I guess from a footballing perspective there are some concerns that there is a lot of hot housing that goes on the boys or and or girls come in, they're in the programme for 12 hours and it needs to be 12 hours of football and it's almost like we're trying to shoehorn information and football into people which maybe doesn't afford us the opportunity to build some of those other qualities, whether that's on the football pitch or away from it. I think that the, the, definitely the environment, particularly within elite sport where there's that, that theory of accumulation, isn't there? And, and the more we do, the better they're going to become yeah. rather than allowing maybe some that time better spent developing those, those yeah. relationships. And Sophia's point about empowerment, that maybe if you build some capacity within them to be able to do it when the coach isn't there, maybe if, if accumulation is important, they're accumulating outside of the time yeah. that they spend in that particular environment. Yeah. I'm, I'm, we're going to take a break there. Um, just to remind those at home, uh, we've had a few questions come in. Uh, please feel free to use the, the, the chat um, function um, on uh, this piece of software. Um, if you want to go and grab a drink, uh, Derek said put the kettle on, um, make a nice cup of tea. Um, we're just going to uh, leave you for a couple of minutes with this thought. Um, so in the initial video, um, the coach spoke about it not being about who is right but what is right. Just reflect on, on the, the sessions that you coach. How do you think you engender um, the coach-athlete relationship and developmental environment within your sessions? Um, so there'll be a short video played and we'll, we'll see you in about two minutes time. My name is Mark Appleson and I'm the director of rugby at the Edinburgh Academy. 
our big rocks every year are kind of to develop the, the players as much as we possibly can. You know, we, we pride ourselves in, in having a, a small school, a small player base, uh, but virtually every single one of our players get better and every single one of our players continue playing rugby when they leave the school. All our teams use Coach Logic, so all the way from under 14s up. We use it for a number of ways. We use it firstly as a video analysis for the coach, so that we video every single game and the coach will get access to those straight away on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, he's got a tagging platform that we've all set up for them so they can look at individual things. As well as that, we get the kids involved, so we, we, we use it as a, a kind of way of starting conversations, so the, the coach will, will clip a video, uh, we'll send it out to a number of people or to, a, to an individual, and we'll try and start a conversation in terms of what went wrong and what we could do to improve. My name is Javier Palacios, I'm the head coach of the first 15 at the Edinburgh Academy. We identify the problem every time they they break our our lane our line was because not because the players were not committed on the tackle but basically because they went on their knees and of course the ball carrier dominate the contact and even the player went down they keep half the possession every time we get the ball we look to score but every time the opposition get the ball i'm worried that we're going to leak tries every single time and this area is, is without doubt the biggest reason for that if we're going to improve our, our kind of dominant tackles, I think it'll be a lot harder for, for teams to score against us. We'll stay in games for longer and think the team, that'll just help everything in terms of confidence and self-belief. Max Blacklock and I play wing or fullback. What I've done to improve my tactical technique is probably look at a lot of film on getting my spacing correct and slowing down before making the tackle because a lot of the time I'm hitting people a lot bigger than me and so I need to focus on just getting low and chopping them. Go Max! Coach Logic's been a really valuable resource in helping me improve this because before, you know, people were just giving you advice verbally, but now when you can really sit down and analyse it and analyse other people as well as yours, you know, people that might be doing better than yours, you can look at what they're doing right and what you're doing wrong and really mend it quicker. It really helps you focus on your main goals and then also your individual goals. It really gets you a lot of time to sit down and think, right, I need to do this, need to do that to get myself uh, to the next level. All right, on three, one, two, three. Okay, welcome back to those of you who are, um, uh, are watching us uh, back home, predominantly in Ireland, I think, I hope all is well uh, back there. Um, so we're just going to start with the question where uh, that we asked you um, before we went to the, the, the tea break, um, and I'm going to ask the question to, to Sophia and Ben. So the, the video of what I think ended up as the lowest scoring uh, NFL game in the end. Um, so the, the coach of the, of the team that, that lost spoke about um, the environment and culture that he wants to create is about not who is right, but what is right. Um, so I guess it's all about we before I, so to speak. How do we create that environment within our session? So I guess it's not about the coach having ultimate power and control of that, but the decision making, uh, the autonomy, the empowerment comes from, from the group as a collective. Yeah, I guess the philosophy probably needs to be a shared one. I think Sophia spoke fairly early in the conversation about the capacity of a coach to flex. And I think any philosophy that's developed, or I guess philosophy is just simply a way of doing things, probably needs to embody what the coach and the particular club and culture believe to be true, but also what's important to the players. And I think the deeper connection and alignment we can get between those two things, probably the more connected to, to the process the players will be in as a result, the coach will probably have a greater opportunity to influence. So I'd say that's fairly key. Yeah. How do we go about doing that, do you think, that shared sort of responsibility? Um, I, I guess there's a collection of things. I guess the kind of standard cliched way of doing it is we all have a meeting and we sit down and agree it. I'm yeah. not suggesting that's a bad thing, but I think we probably need to look at what's discussed and shared in a mutual uh, 
um, whole team, club environment, but also what's done on an individual basis, because it may be that there are certain individuals who will say certain things in a particular environment they won't say in another one. And I think as much as we can recognise what the individual needs are and maybe flex our behaviour with an individual as well as recognising what the collective agreed needs are and how we flex our behaviour to meet the needs of that collective group of people and the things that they've committed to say is important, is probably fairly important. That's a very good point, thanks, Yeah, it is it's important to... Um, <coughs> We, we have to appreciate that um, knowledge is inherently interdependent uh, and e each one athlete has got knowledge and understanding and we need to accumulate that knowledge and understanding in order to make um, not just the athlete but the collective um, uh, much stronger and better. Um, so it's, it's appreciating the collective but in order to appreciate the collective you have or the coach has to connect with each one athlete in the squad and accumulate that information and make it something bigger for the benefit of the team. Thank you for that. Um, <coughs> we've got some uh, we've got some questions coming, so thank you for those. Keep, please keep on on sending them in. Um, it's a really interesting one here from uh, Nanika. Um, I hope I've pronounced your, your name correctly. Um, in terms of uh, the respect to the relationship, where do athletes need to draw a line? which distinguishes in independence from dependence. So is there a need for them not to be too dependent on their coaches? And when can dependence become harmful to the athletes? Yes, that's a, a, a good question. Um, um, the way I understand it is that we don't uh, talk about dependence or independence. Uh, we talk about interdependence. Uh, it is important that uh, the coach and the athlete uh, connect to, to some level. Uh, and. Um, <coughs> Uh, I think um, when you feel that you are securely attached with, with your coach, for example, uh, you are more likely to, to take risks uh, in the knowledge that you are not going to um, be punished or um, humiliated or, or um, be seen as, um, <coughs> as someone who um, uh, is, is negatively. Mm. Uh, so I think to be connected with a coach is crucial for becoming autonomous okay. uh, and trying things uh, and risk things without fearing. And when do you think that, when can it become, I mean, the, the word there is being used is too, too harmful, but when can that, when can we maybe become over dependent on, on, on that relationship? Yes, uh, yes, there are instances where, I mean, uh, and it will depend on, on the individual athletes. There are athletes, uh, because of their personality, their character, the way that they have um, um, brought up, the way they are nurtured, they, they need more time uh, from the coaches. Um, they may be um, uh, uh, less uh, secure in their attachments or associations, connections, and they may consume a lot of time from, from their coach. And, and, and this needs to be um, handled uh, or managed quite delicately from the coach. Um, and over time, uh, the athlete, hopefully, uh, with the way that the uh, uh, the coach will interact, uh, will feel um, more comfortable being uh, more independent from uh, from from the coach. But the, the, I think that um, relates to the character of the athlete, or the personality of the athlete, uh, this over reliance uh, to the coach. Um, um, That's great. Thank you. Um, Another question from uh, Veronica, I think. Um, ben, I'll direct this at you to begin with. Um, are there any differences uh, in terms of the coach's approach to develop quality relations when comparing uh, different coaching contexts? So, i.e., whether I'm dealing with young people in an uh, elite environment setting, whether it's recreational or whether it's uh, amateur stroke competitive sport? I guess like when we spoke before about the, the philosophy bit, the vision bit, I guess it's about being quite clear about what everybody is there, what their purpose for being there is, and then as a result deciding what be the mo mo what might be the most appropriate behaviours in that environment. Yeah. I think um, a teenage perspective, the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until I think we're into our 20s. Mm. That's the part of the brain that develops that deals with emotions, decision making and social interaction. Um, in the absence of that part of the brain, the coach probably needs to be mindful of the fact that when people are taking risks, when they're feeling pressure, it might be that the coach needs to dampen down those environments to make those interactions a little bit softer and a little bit more friendly. Yeah. Um, when children 
the young children are first experiencing and experimenting with the game, it may be that they want lots of positive feedback, lots of reassurance and encouragement, which will keep them coming back. Yeah. And the more they keep coming back, the more success they get, the more they fall in love with the game. Probably further down the line, we might have an opportunity to start to correct and change some of those behaviours as we move forward. Yeah. However, I think it's also important to say that praise pretty much works with everybody. Yeah. And as long as that praise perhaps isn't too elaborately or too lavishly praised, and it's not, not specific enough, I think that will work probably well with an adult as it does with an eight-year-old. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, um, nowadays coaches, particularly um, uh, when they deal with a little older um, uh, athletes, um, more, perhaps more senior, um, I think I hear a lot saying that uh, they want athletes who are accountable and responsible for, for their own actions. They, they need to get take control of, of their development as an athlete. Um, and, and the key to that, um, often they say they don't see that, um, uh, that the, the athletes need a lot of um, uh, pushing and stretching, you know, and, uh, and supporting. Um, and it may be that we can cultivate that and nurture that when they are much younger. So it, it may be that our coaches, right from the, the, the younger age groups, uh, try to create, whilst try to create uh, connections, but also create that athlete that can uh, be uh, um, accountable and responsible for their own development. I think attached to that, that when we are offering ownership and responsibility, particularly early on, it, both in their development process and in our relationship, it's probably important that there are very few consequences as a result of them getting that wrong, whatever that looks like. Because yeah. if we want to cultivate ownership and responsibility, we've got to recognise if they're relatively inexperienced, that it might not necessarily look how we want it to look. And in the same way that we might want to develop passing and dribbling skills, you probably need to develop ownership and responsibility yeah. skills in young people also. And that pivots around trust. The, the coaches need yeah. to trust their athletes that they can do it. Mm -hmm and um, um, they need to give them the opportunities to display uh, that they, I can do it without your presence or, um, uh, or with your presence, for that matter. Um, and then just going on to something that we spoke about um, uh, towards the start um, around vulnerability, um, Veronica has asked, um, can you explain further regarding coaches' signs of, um, sorry, it's just skipped up there, coaches' signs of vulnerability, often coaches are perceived to be the leader. Yeah, um, I, I think um, coaches need to be the leaders um, uh, and we must not lose sight of the, f of the fact that coaches are there to lead, direct, instruct, orchestrate, uh, but at the same time um, we need to appreciate that in order to do a good work as we have been uh, discussing here in this uh, forum, uh, the relationship is very important, the connection is very important um, and it's very purposeful for effective and successful coaching. At the same time, we need to appreciate um, that whilst the, they are the leaders, they don't know it all. Mm. And I suppose that comes with being vulnerable and accepting yeah. that, okay, I, I'm not quite sure how or why or when I can do certain things, but I'll find out. Yeah. Because the, the athletes ultimately um, want, want to hear their, uh, their coaches that they can help them, they can bring them to the next level of, yeah. of, of performance, yeah. that they have the expertise, the knowledge, the competencies, the, to, uh, to elevate their performance and uh, make them skillful um, players or athletes. Yeah. And I guess it d depends about how we determine vulnerability. Yeah. It might just be that <coughs> I share with them stuff about my personal life in the same way that yeah. we encourage them to share yeah. stuff about our personal life. So yeah. it shows that we are just, whether we're seen as coach or athletes, we yeah. are just human beings engaged in a sporting yeah. pursuit. And I think if you look at the, the look at the literature and the readings around what a good leader is, taking coaching out of the, out of the context, just being a good leader, mm -hmm. exhibiting more human skills, I guess, whether that's kindness, the ability to listen, to facilitate and so on, and vulnerability, I guess, would be would be part of that. Um, I guess, uh, leading on to that, uh, uh, Mark has asked, how and when should we start promoting leadership skills in, in young players? And I guess leadership skills being an integral part of that coach-athlete relationship. Should we wait to see natural leaders step up um, and then support their growth, or do we try to make them all leaders? And then if that's the case, how would you do that within a structure of a team without confusing um, the natural sort of leaders within that, within that group? I'd say we can probably start today. Yeah. I don't necessarily know that it's something that you have to wait until they're a particular yeah. age yeah. to be able to do it. And then I guess you're trying to determine what leadership is. Yeah. Leadership for one person might be being the captain in a traditional sense, who does the team talks, who drive people on, who takes set pieces, who's responsible for making decisions. Mm -hmm. Leadership for another might just be organising the shirts in the changing room. Leadership for another person who perhaps struggles with their social interaction might be going up to others and saying, well done today. 
So I think we can probably determine what leadership looks like in the whole environment mm -hmm. and then maybe what individual people's roles are in that. I think the final thing is if you do find natural leaders in a particular environment, it may be that they can be negatively constraining on the opportunity for other people who may have good leadership capacity to actually allow it to emerge. And it may be at times that those leaders are removed to play in a different team for whatever reason, because as a result, it may be that other people's leadership emerges in the absence of others. Yeah, I only wanted to, ask, uh, to add to uh, uh, that. Um, that um, we need to see um, um, leadership in every athlete. Uh, every athlete, every player is a leader. And, um, and we need to cultivate that somehow to, to each one athlete. And then again, um, a question from uh, Martin, which I guess I think leads on to that. H how, do we, how do we encourage those quieter, less natural, naturally gifted leaders um, to maybe communicate better with us both on and off the pitch? Are there any strategies that we can, can we utilise within that coach athlete relationship to build those? Well, I, you look at the culture, I suppose, uh, and um, I, to some degree the culture is uh, determined or shaped um, uh, in, 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 uh, from, as a starting point from, from the coach uh, and then um, is defined or refined uh, through the interactions between the coach and the athlete. And um, uh, as I said, little things uh, can make a huge difference, um, like um, ensuring that everybody says hello to everybody and uh, uh, everybody's open up, uh, is, is open and uh, approachable and uh, responsive. Uh, all the characteristics that may, may make good quality relationships are, thing is, are the things or the skills that we need to enforce uh, within a culture, within a team. And sorry, and being, and being mindful that some people are just wired to be a bit quieter and a bit softer. Uh, and I'm minded of a, a player that was in an international camp that one of the coaches said, we need to get him to look people in the eye and we need to get him to speak more loudly when he's talking. And my question was, is he okay? Is he okay in this environment? Is maybe he just a bit softer and a bit quieter? Because mm -hmm. when he plays, he leads by example. He may not lead in terms of being noisy, being loud and being uh, uh, easily noticeable, but he leads by his behaviour. And I guess if everybody is a similar type of leader, you're probably going to end up with a degree of conflict that might be unmanageable. Yeah. And I guess that's going back to the point you made right at the beginning about knowing each individual and, so, and, and developing those individuals within that coach. There's stu I mean, there's, there's some stuff around personality where mm. some people stretch themselves to have to mm. talk and put themselves forward. Actually, they're more comfortable being quiet. Um, final question before I think we probably will finish up with a, a pertinent topic around coach athlete, and I'm going to add, which I haven't warned you both, parent relationship. So we might we'll deal with that right, right at the end. But um, final question from Simon. Um, He's looking at how do we embrace this sort of culture across the club where mistakes are part of the learning process um, and then how can we ingrain that in within a culture throughout the whole of the club through maybe our, the coach-athlete relationship. Um, uh, the, the sort of reading between the lines here it's about how, how do we get to that stage or I guess at the moment that may, might not necessarily be the case. If I understand the question uh, correctly, I think it goes back to what I said earlier about um, um, starting from the coach, you know, setting the scene and, and uh, highlighting to everybody how important it is that uh, we have an environment where um, uh, we, everybody's voice is important, uh, that we value everybody's um, concerns, fears, thoughts, and uh, um, uh, it is important for a athletes to give their feedback, uh, to raise their concerns, uh, to admit errors. Um, that's all part of the, the process of, of becoming uh, better. So setting the scene, allowing, uh, explain, explaining, uh, explicating to each one athlete that this is the environment we want to um, uh, facilitate. Uh, then um, reminding through the process to the coach, uh, to the, every athlete, uh, that it is important to um, uh, say what they, they want, uh, how they feel it, uh, what it is. Uh, and finally, when athletes come forward uh, with um, um, their thoughts, um, thanking them and appreciating their courage for uh, voicing it. I think sometimes in a larger club setting, particularly if it's kind of an amateur grassroots club, those things are incredibly challenging mm -hmm. because you often end up with 10, 15, 20, 30 teams that almost operate as individual teams rather than as a coherent club. 
I think all of Sophia's points about her C's, about how you develop a degree of closeness, which might be the coaches getting together on a Sunday night for something to eat. It doesn't need to be a formal CPD in the traditional sense, but going to the pub if that's acceptable, going to the coffee, whatever it is, just getting coaches together to share some of those experiences. I think also the bit about where we organise team chronologically. I think if there's opportunities for coaches to shift across age groups, maybe work with other coaches and share some of those experiences, I think the deeper understanding we develop of the people around us probably the greater degree of alignment we're going to get between the, the towards the behaviours that we think are more acceptable. I think that was one of the strong points that came across when uh, we did our previous workshop over in, 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 in Dublin and uh, some of the Leinster coaches visited a very successful French rugby team and, and their day started all uh, with, a, with a breakfast in a particular cafe and it wasn't just the, the first team coach but it was players, chefs, groundsmen and so on. So I think that's a, that's a really good really good point and, uh, and you begin to to lose some of the hierarchies maybe in, in terms of that, that process. Um, the other thing I, I would suggest as well maybe having some of the players and the young players on that committee of management and they become part of the decision making process rather than leaving it just up to the, to, to the adults as well. Um, okay um, we, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up with the um, um, that sort of the coach athlete parent relationship and, and how we might, what are some of the things that we can do as coaches to, I guess, maybe open up that relationship. Um, it, it's probably one that is, puts a fear into the coaches the, the most. I know I've always been told never make eye contact with the parents. So how, 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 do, we, how do we go beyond that? How do we, um, I guess, to, to normalise the, the coach athlete stroke parent relationship so it, it, it doesn't always have this sort of tension within it so to speak. I think in, sorry, yeah, go ahead. the informal interaction stuff yeah. that we're speaking about from player to athlete, yeah. sorry from coach to athlete is as important as from coach to parent okay. um, and I, I know similar to you earlier in my career it was very much keep the parents as far away as possible yeah. and I came by more problems keeping yeah. the parents as far yeah. away as possible than I did by trying to yeah. keep them close a little yeah. bit and I think sometimes the informal interactions develop a human level, mm. which make those interactions a little bit easier. Yeah. Second thing that someone taught me very early on, which has helped me enormously, is like the, the benefit of third person praise, yeah. which is if you're the athlete and this is the parent, that yeah. the praise that I'm giving you would be within earshot of parent. Mm. Because sometimes parents say what they say because they don't really know what to say. And sometimes they fall onto clumsy language and clumsy conversations because they're not sure what to say. Mm. And if we can say something positive, that might be what gets reinforced. Mm. I think also as well sometimes we can, I know rules don't necessarily um, land well with people, but sometimes we can just have some basic rules that after the game, I'm not speaking to the parents about selection or the result, yeah. we'll speak about it the next time at training, because often when our emotions are high that can be where some of those relationships end up fractured as a result of people saying and doing things which maybe emotions are a little too high to be dealing with in that moment. Yeah. Um, and and uh, the coaches must not forget that um, parents can be a huge resource mm -hmm. for, for them yeah. and a, a, a great deal of support. Um, so, um, um, and, and we can't for, you know, uh, kind of neglect the fact that the parents are there and perhaps uh, give the coaches a little bit of a hard time simply because they want to, to support and help yeah. uh, their child. Yeah. Um, uh, I think what coaches can't do to facilitate uh, a better relationship um, or, or a partnership with the, with the parents, uh, if that uh, occurs, uh, is provide them with inform information. Parents want information, uh, want opportunities to help, and um, uh, and um, it's it's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah, I'd I'd, I'd agree, and I definitely uh, sort of reiterate what you just both said, that, that the openness of that relationship actually is, is, is really important and um, I think if you can keep that, that, that trust and honesty within that, I don't, I don't think there's, that, that relationship only becomes more, more healthy and more, more transparent as you, as you move along. Um, I think we're coming to, towards the, the end of our, uh, our session now. I just want to, um, to thank you, all of those who've um, participated in terms of the question and for um, the numerous coaches that we've had uh, listen to us predominantly back, uh, or back in Ireland, so thank you for giving up your, your precious time. Um, once again, just to, to thank Coach Logic for uh, providing the technology uh, that has enabled this um, webinar to, to happen. 
to Derek Mabry for um, once again using his powers of persuasion to, to get everyone uh, around the table. Um, and finally to Sophia, thank you very, uh, very much for giving up your, your precious time and, and having, having us here at Loughborough. Thank you very much. Um, and Thank also you. Ben um, for driving up the M1 uh, to spend uh, an hour and, and sharing some of your, your knowledge and thoughts on this topic. It's been, been very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, so uh, there will be a short video um, that will play at the end of some of Sophia's work that she's, um, she's done here at Loughborough. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about this topic, um, please watch the video um, at the end. Um, once again, thanks very much. Uh, thank you to Leinster for organising and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Hi, my name is Sophia Jowett. I work at Loughborough University within the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences. My research and that of my research team revolves around trying to understand the complex interpersonal dynamics that occur between coaches and athletes. Based on our research, we have developed a short educational program that aims to raise athletes' awareness of the importance of the coach-athlete relationship and encourage athletes to play their part in making this relationship effective and successful. The educational program we have developed contains three short presentations of 10 minutes each in the following topics. Coach-athlete relationship quality, coach-athlete conflict and coach-athlete communication. It also includes quizzes and activities that allows athletes to test and apply their knowledge. Finally, high-profile athletes, coaches and other sport professionals discuss what they think about the important role of the coach-athlete relationship for sport excellence.